So, Andrew Dennison, given some of those French statements that we've heard, are France, Britain, and the U.S. Uh, truly setting out to protect civilians, or are they intervening in a tribal civil war? Both. Both. Unfortunately, you can't separate the two. In wars, people die. Civilians die. Anytime you want to stop a war, influence a war, be a party in a war, you're going to be involved in the lives of civilians. That said, I think that we can agree the West in general has been quite friendly towards dictators in the Arab world. Um, the friend or the enemy of my enemy is my friend, you could say. But I think there's one thing that's even worse than associating with these less than stable dictators. And that is when they start to fall, then to say that um, we have no responsibility for it. Kind of the Frankenstein's monster problem. You see it a lot with America. The classic case is we were buddies with the Soviet Union to take down Nazi Germany. And afterwards, well, we had to deal with the Soviet Union. To help take down the Soviet Union, we made friends with all sorts of bad guys. Some of them, like Osama bin Laden, we had to take care of afterwards. Yes, France has been involved, perhaps even immorally, in selling weapons to Libya and butting up with the former Tunisian government. But to me, that's all the more reason now to take responsibility when that arrangement no longer holds. Okay, but let's talk again. What does it mean to take responsibility in this case? You say they're doing both. They're protecting civilians, but also intervening in a civil war. Does that mean the actual aim is to kill or at least get rid of Muammar Gaddafi? Well, I think that um, it's not going to be that difficult to take down the formally organized military forces that support Gaddafi that are so able to kill civilians if there's no armed resistance. What will be much more difficult is the security vacuum that follows, where there will be ethnic rivalries and the best defense is a good offense. So you start shooting suspects even before they shoot you. And in that situation, yes, I think there will need to be an international presence to help broker the recreation of a government. Difficult, expensive. Uh, we can be happy that we've seized Gaddafi's assets. That could at least be a down payment on getting some outside, particularly Arab forces, into Libya once Gaddafi's government has been broken, which I don't think is impossible. I think that will happen. You'll find it very difficult to say this is Mr. New Libya or a group of people. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's the, the nature of, of, of replacing a bad government. You don't know who is your friend and who not. And as hard as it is, the alternative, letting Qaddafi wreak havoc over the country and coming back in five years to deal with the problem, I think that would be worse from a humanitarian perspective. But this is not only a humanitarian intervention. Clear geopolitical interests rooted in power relationships are here at play. We have seen... You mean it's really about oil after all? No, it's about the whole Mideast. And oil is a part of it, because oil is not only a source of energy, it's a source of power. It allows Gaddafi to buy more than a billion dollars worth of arms from Europe since 2004. Those arms in the wrong hands, of course, are a problem. And it's really the whole Mideast that is in play, a three-dimensional chessboard where we have seen revolution political uprising spread like wildfire. People are no longer afraid. They see the example of others. And whether we like it or not, Libya has become a litmus test for the whole region. Can force succeed in brutally suppressing the uprisings, or is there another way towards a better day? And that's what stands at stake. For Egypt, if Gaddafi would succeed, makes Egypt much more difficult. In the long term, we look over Saudi Arabia, Persian Gulf, into Iran. If Gaddafi succeeds, the Green Revolution in Iran knows they can be shot down. No one's going to do anything. So much more is at stake here than the hundreds of thousands of refugees and the possible massacres. That we, we heard the U.S. Defense Secretary saying in no uncertain terms that he did not think intervention would be a good idea. Andrew Dennison, do you uh, have some sympathy for the German decision under those circumstances? Well, I know that there are costs. You know, it's like if you have cancer in your arm or something horrible like that. You know, some people say, oh, don't cut off your arm, you know. It, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be horrible. Well, it's a lot worse if you don't deal with the problem. So yes, there are military costs. Yes, Melinda, we don't know where this is going to end up. Nevertheless, to simply stand aside and say, because we think this might be a problem and difficult, we don't want to have any part of it, I think goes against Germany's fundamental interests as part of a Western community, but also as a neighbor of Libya, as a country that has a real interest in stability on the other side of the Mediterranean. My 
silver lining on this dark cloud is that across the political spectrum in Germany, you've heard criticism of this decision. And I really hope that after the elections, whatever role they play, that Germany will revisit this decision and we will see more solidarity. Yeah, I mean, the question is, Arab Andrew Dennison, how much incentive do the Arabs have to be part of it? If we look at Bahrain, which the U.S. Uh, has continued to support, if we look at Yemen, these are leaders who are very much in the same position as Gaddafi, yeah. oppressing their own people. There's a certain, certain contradiction there, both for the Arabs and for the United States, isn't there? Right. I mean, there's a difference between countries in the Arab world where the United States has influence because of long built up military relationships and relationships with NGOs, like Egypt. There's also a difference between big countries like Egypt, Iran, and Turkey, and the little ones. That said, I think that the Egyptians and the Tunisians are neighbors who have an interest in stability. They will be helping us. Other Arab countries might come in. And at the end of the day, Europeans have to be there. It's Europe's backyard. It's Europe's future. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for being with us today, and thanks to all of you out there for tuning in.